Good evening to all of you. I'm James Wilson, Assistant Professor in the Department of the Humanities here at Villanova. And it's my privilege to welcome you to this year's Faith and Culture Lecture. I'd like to extend particular welcome to Dr. Paul Mariani, who will speak with us tonight, and Ben Raymond, who is where? To Ben, who will be introducing Dr. Mariani more fully in just a few moments. The Faith and Culture Lecture is an annual event sponsored by the Department of Humanities and the Office for Mission and Ministry, intended to bring distinguished scholars, as well as contemporary writers and artists to Villanova to explore the profound and complex interanimation of religious faith, theology, the humanities, and the arts in a forum open both to students and to the general public. Past speakers have included such distinguished theologians and poets as Dr. Jo or, excuse me, Father John Sayward, Dana Joya, and Kevin Hart, and we are very pleased that this tradition continues tonight. I'd like to thank the Office of Mission and Ministry and the Humanities Department for making this event possible, and to thank in particular Barbara Wall, Marcy Brady, and Marie Kelly for their support of, planning for, and good work toward tonight's event. Again, thanks to all of you. And now I'll take my leave by introducing Ben Raymond, a senior and double major in humanities and English. He will be introducing Dr. Mariani to us all. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Okay. Um, I stand here before you tonight honored, um, tasked with introducing tonight's speaker, um, Dr. Paul Mariani. Holding a chair in the English Department at Boston College, Dr. Mariani is an accomplished and admired professor by his peers and students alike, the author of five biographies and six volumes of poetry, and a recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Endowment for the Arts. His resume, the list of accolades as an academic, as a biographer, and as a poet, is far too long for me to hear and recount. But suffice it to say, his successes in any one of these disciplines would see most of our careers fulfilled and perhaps our envies abated. His his, his, excuse me, his, the subject of Dr. Mariani's lecture this evening is renowned poet of Victorian England and convert to the Jesuit order, Gerard Manley Hopkins. Today celebrated as one of the foremost poets of the Victorian era, Hopkins began his prolific writing career at Oxford, where he studied classics and graduated with honors in 1867. Whilst at Oxford, Hopkins, inspired by John Henry Newman, made the difficult and harrowing decision to convert from Anglicanism to the Roman Catholic Church, a decision which isolated Hopkins not only from his peers and instructors at Oxford, but also from his own family. A year later, Hopkins joined the, joined the Jesuit order, burnt much of his juvenilia, and in many ways started anew. For the next 20 years before his death in 1889, uh, Hopkins would go on to write some of the most celebrated and recognizable poetry of his time. Few, if any, have better celebrated his life than our guest tonight. In his book, God in the Imagination, Dr. Mariani writes, if I had not discovered Hopkins, I would have had to invent him. <laughs> the deeply personal kinship Dr. Mariani feels with Hopkins, the passion with which he elegizes his life and work, translates effortlessly into the pages of his recent biography. Dr. Mariani resurrects his subject, pulls him out of the shadows, and casts light onto one of literature's most admirable and enigmatic figures. For him, the duty of the biographer goes well beyond mere recounting of a man's life. Of this duty, Mariani writes, if biographers have done their work well, they will send their reader back to the poetry again, and so back to the source, to return to someone whose voice and gestures readers have come to recognize and perhaps even love. Dr. Mariani's biography of Hopkins has accomplished for readers everywhere just that. It has sent them for another turn on the wings of the Windhover, for another tragic foray to the wreck of the Deutschland, and to ponder again the mystery and magnificence of God's grandeur. I am sure that after hearing him speak here tonight, you will all be likewise inspired to turn the pages of Hopkins' poetry, perhaps again, and perhaps for the very first time. On behalf of Villanova University and our esteemed Department of Humanities, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Paul Mariani. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you hear me, by the way? Yes, good, uh, for that wonderful introduction. I truly appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> OK, what Hopkins can teach us. I'm here this evening addressing you 
a smiling public man, as Yeats once wrote, because of something that happened to me nearly 50 years ago. I was an undergraduate then, like many of you out there in the audience tonight, and I was in my last year at Manhattan College, like one of your own English professors, Jim Murphy, here at Villanova. It was winter, it was early 1962, and the class was held in what I remember as a garret-like room on the campus of Manhattan College up in the Bronx. Professor Paul Cortisos had assigned each of us. We were all young men back then, before Manhattan went co-ed. And I'd been assigned some poems by William Butler Yeats to address the morning class, most of them still sleepy from working late hours, stocking shelves, a few still half hung over from visiting the local pubs down by the L the night before. And one of my classmates, and a frat brother to boot, made a deal with me. His name was James, James Blake, and he would later change it to Seamus as he became more and more invested in all things Irish. The English patronym Blake he allowed to stay because of its classical resonance. <laughs> I suppose, with tigers shining bright in the blank, blank night. He'd been assigned a poet named Gerard Manley Hopkins, but the poet he was really dying to do was Yeats, the man I'd been assigned. I'll buy you a beer, he tried cajoling me over coffee in Plato's cave. <laughs> and I, who had been fascinated to learn that this Hopkins had been a Jesuit priest, and therefore that rarity a Catholic poet, was willing to make the change, though the cost would be two beers at the Greenleaf. <laughs> two beers it was then, and we both settled into our allotted futures, Jim doing the Irish poet he loved, as it turns out, I did too, and me pursuing the poet who had composed the record of the Deutschland with its majestic opening, the mastering me God, giver of breath and bread, and the Wind Hover, and Felix Randall, and Carrie and Comfort, among so many others. That interest has become for me, it seems now, more of a road map, or a talisman, or a beacon, an obsession almost, trying to net the spirit of this man in the interstices of the language, a shape-shifting project which by definition would seem impossible, and is though one keeps trying. Where to begin? Where to travel? Where to end? Where to begin my own telling of that story, the story of a man, an Anglican student at the top of his class at Oxford, back in a time when this country was at war with itself, and a poet named Walt Whitman was nursing the sick. Gerard Manley Hopkins, oldest of eight surviving children, in a well-to-do mid-Victorian family with Papa and Mama and talented siblings undergoing a religious crisis at college which would change everything for him and bring him abruptly finally over to the Catholic Church, which in that time was bad enough from a social, intellectual, and economic perspective, but worse to then become a priest and a despised Jesuit to boot. Which is why I began my biography where I did, with the moment of religious crisis. Let me read the opening to you. The world is charged with the grandeur of God, Hopkins believed. He believed it from his undergraduate years at Oxford as an Anglican seeker, believed it so strongly that it led in large part to his conversion to the Roman Catholic Church, believed it as a Jesuit and called on both Ignatius's spiritual exercises and the insights of the philosopher Duns Scotus into Christ's incarnation to formulate a theodicy and a poetics which would articulate and sing what his whole self, head and heart, felt. And the evidence of that grandeur came to be everywhere for him in the sublime Alps as in violets and running streams, and in the 10,000 faces which reflected the very face of God. All that was wanting, he believed, was the beholder. And when the beheld and the beholder once met, 
when the essential nature of the thing was instressed upon the eye, ear, tongue, and mind. The heart could not help but rise up as at a sudden unheard symphony, a dance, the heart growing bold and bolder as it hurled itself after its creator, the one who bowed there and abided. But to realize this way of seeing into the heart of things would eventually cost him everything, for it would mean giving himself over to this new reality, deeper and more satisfying than anything else he had ever felt, an unbearable likeness everywhere about us, and only the insulation of self-preoccupation, <clears throat> keeping the self from feeling its staggering, terrifying sweetness and tenderness. More, Hopkins' own poetry would come to be charged with incarnating the same reality. It would be his response to the incredible gifts God had lavished on him as an artist. His language, too, would come to be charged with a barbarously refined new energy. But only as he remained true to what he had been charged with doing, singing the earth's praise and bringing news to others of what he had been privileged to see and understand. It would be his overture responding to God's smile. He would not sing of himself as Whitman was singing of himself there in the new world, nor would he dwell on himself as Lucifer had done before his fall. He would direct himself outwardly toward the sublime other. At least that was his dream, his reason for uttering his poems, though in time he would plunge deeper into the abyss of the stark self than any poet since Milton. Oh, we lash with the best or worst word last, he would come to understand. How a lush cap, plush cap slow, will mouth to flesh burst gush, flush the man, the being with it, sour or sweet brim in a flash full. That final yes or no to God's universe, of which he realized with honeyed exultation or salt bitterness he was but a mere spark, a floating moat, would be at the heart of it and provide for him on his journey, if that was what it was, through its unexpected protean shiftings. And not only for the years of philosophical inquiry, not only for the search at Oxford for what remained of Newman and Pusey's movement toward a more integrated Catholic vision, not only for his search for a religious community to which he could swear fraternal fidelity, whether as a contemplative with the Benedictines or with the Franciscans, or as it turned out with the Jesuits, together with Ignatius' vision of a contemplative order in action, serving wherever it was needed, as needed, like a soldier following orders. I did say yes, he would acknowledge trembling at the memory of it. When at lightning and last rod, God heard him, truer than tongue confess thy terror, O Christ, O God. But was that confession a cry of surrender <coughs> or the cry of someone unable any longer to hold back the stress of something surging to the very marrow of his soul? It would be the beginning, too, of his realization that he would have to give up remaining where he was, on ground he understood the symbolic remembrance of Christ in the Eucharist because that way of seeing things was no longer enough. He would come to hunger after nothing less than the real presence. God actually indwelling in things as simple as bread and wine and see it as the logical extension of God's indwelling among us, pitching his tent in the desert of ourselves so that he could speak to us as he had with Moses in the tent. Two look at the world around them. One thinks of oil or gold or another human being and puts a value on it or him or her. Another looks at the world and sees news of God's presence calling. Or two look at a piece of bread or a cup of wine and see bread or wine only, the quotidian, the physical thing itself, while another looks at the same two things and is shaken to the very core by the God-saturated reality brimming in the deep itself. And these ways of seeing come to make all the difference in one's life, 
one's thoughts, even in the way one comes to taste words. And so with Hopkins, who for complex reasons needed, he felt, to become a Catholic and better, worse, a Jesuit priest. Neither choice could possibly lead to preferment or even acceptance in his world, the world of late Victorian England. But they were those choices, the logical outcome for him of much deep thinking and soul searching. It would mean going counter to the secular and agnostic cutting edge thinking of his own day, whether that thinker was Hegel or Lyell or Darwin or Freud. It would mean creating a radically new idiom that would lead to the renewal and possibilities of English, giving it back something of its original Anglo-Saxon force, besides recovering anew the all but forgotten beauties of plain chant. It would mean a poetry lettered and saturated with a language shimmering with the possibilities of a sacramental vision of the world around us. It would come to mean the possibility of actually renewing both the world and its words. So give it a day, a date, a going forth, a crossing over, all in an instant, finally, a yes and a yes again. Call it Wednesday, July the 18th. 1866. Call it an out-of-the-way point somewhere south of London and name it Horsham on a dull midsummer's day with curds and away clouds faintly appearing and disappearing. Call it what he would with its wondrous irresistible forces working on him. The instress of it, like the ooze of virgin oil crushed in the press of God's hands, an anointing, a yielding, a yes. So, where does this lead in terms of the man and the poet? It means going underground, like those lost years in the life of Christ, if you will, except that here we have a good deal of information and startling electric prose. But it isn't until December of 1875, when Hopkins is 31, that he sits down and begins to write an ode to five Franciscan nuns drowned in the wreck of the North German steamship, aptly named the Deutschland, that what Hopkins has been moving towards under great stress is finally <coughs> and brilliantly realized and released. So, how compress a man's life into 50 minutes and then speak of the ways he has shaped my life spiritually and artistically? Let's try by looking at three of Hopkins' poems and then at one of my own. First off then, let's look at God's grandeur from 1877, the year that he became a Jesuit priest. Okay. I'll read it. Don't mind. God's grandeur, February 1877. Um, Hopkins is just months away from ordination as a Jesuit priest. He'll be ordained in September. And suddenly, uh, he's already written the record of the Deutschland. It has not appeared. He, he would hope he had hoped that it would appear in the Jesuit magazine, The Month. It was looked at, but it was rejected. Rejected. He goes back and he begins to write a series of sonnets, Petrarchan sonnets. This is the first one that he writes, God's grandeur. <clears throat> the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. 
And though the last lights of the black west went, O oh, morning, at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. Beautiful poem. Beautiful poem. What does he say? The world is charged with, and they both get an accent, charged with, they're kind of spondy, okay? Packed, spondy in it. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. Well, yes, it's charged with, that is, this is its duty. This is its responsibility to sing praise back to its creator, especially us who have consciousnesses. That's what we, you know, just say thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the daylight. Thanks for the sun. Thanks for the moon. Thanks for the food. Thanks for the, my mother, my father, my, you know, my wife, uh, kids, uh, you know, whatever. Thanks for my students. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for so many things. Good wine, uh, whatever, okay. Good meal, like we had tonight, some good pasta, some uh, lamb, done rare, nice, okay. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. I mean, there's so many things, so many blessings that we get, and we get them so often. All, all you really have to do is just say thanks, okay? It's sort of like a host, care, you know, have, or a host is having a party, and then they go, you know, people come in and eat the food and drink, and they don't even say thank you. You know, they, well, what is that? So that's what we were made for, Hopkins says, is to praise. Praise, just thank you, thank you. And he says, this grandeur of God is charged with, he says, this world is charged with. It's also, it's like, elect, it, the image is a metaphor, elect, an electrical metaphor. L like the whole world is filled with electricity. It's charged. It's filled with energy. All you have to do is somehow tap into it. Okay, just slow down. Just become aware be, that, that in fact there's an electric current going through things, a beautiful electric current. Charged with. The trouble is, he says, is that we, we wear heavy shoes. We, we wear boots. Shod, later on. Shod. We're shoed. Why don't you take your shoes off? Okay, do this. Maybe, yeah, you can still do it. It's, it's still September. Take your shoes and socks off and just walk in the grass. Just feel the grass beneath your feet rather than the macadam or whatever. Okay? Um, just come in contact with the world around you. This is something that uh, was very important to Hopkins. Just if you could just loosen the collar just a little bit, you know, and just breathe in. And he says, this grandeur, he says, will flame out, he says, in two ways. It will flame out like that in an instant, like he says, shining from shirk foil. The way, for example, if you took gold foil or aluminum foil, and you know the way they see the sun flares off of, of, of aluminum foil or off of foil, it just flares back. You see it at the beaches off and that kind of thing. It's suddenly there, boom, and it's, you can't escape it. The eyes are almost dazzled by the, by, that's the way God's grandeur can sometimes, he says there's another way too. He says it can come at you slowly, sort of like the way you, if you take good olives and you crush them in an olive press and slowly the drip by drip, you know, the, the uh, yellow gold of the, of the oil drips through, you see, and it gathers to a greatness like that ooze of oil. He says, you know, in fact, if you think about it, he said, that's the way it works with, uh, with the way God enters our lives. He says, for some of us, he says, he knocks you, to you off your feet, okay? I'm not saying off the horse, because there is no horse, okay? But he knocks you off, he knocks you off, your, uh, knocks you off your feet like Paul on his way to Damascus, okay? In an instant, he's transformed, he's changed. An extraordinary metanoia. With others like Augustine, it may, you know, Augustine, okay? It may take many years. Lord, change me, but, uh, but not yet. Okay, not yet, you know. Uh, I got too many things I want to do, but later I would like to be converted, okay? Um, and then he realizes he's lost a lot of time. Um, but in either way, God waits. God is out there, and this is the way he touches us. Slowly, um, by degrees, you know, uh, especially for slow-witted people like myself, or some, with some people it's in an instant they're transformed. And he says, if this is so, then why do men then now not wreck his rod? Why don't, why don't they follow him? He says, why? He says, look what we've done. He says, we're like, he says, like, we're like heavy, great gray dray horses, you know, going around in a great big circle, you know, uh, harnessed in and just crushing the uh, whatever, the oil, the wheat, whatever. Um, and we go around and around and we make a path. But we don't look out, we just keep doing the same thing, the same job, the same cubicle, day after day after day without breaking out, okay? 
And he says, and everything, he says, all is seared. And he, 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 he triples that rhyme. He, all is seared with trade. Everything has a, a price on it. Everything has a, how much is that worth? How, how much you want for that watch? How much you want for this? How much you want for that? What's it worth? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all is seared with trade, and it's bleared. It's, 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 the colors have gone out of it. They're smeared with our toil. And they, everything wears man's smell and smudge and, and shares man's smell. And even the soil, he says. Look what we've done to the soil. Strip mining in his time. That was one big thing, strip mining, okay, for, for, um, for minerals or for oil. Um, uh, leaving dirt behind. You, you know, you just leave a, a, an empty parking lot filled with, uh, uh, with, a, a, with a concrete. And, and, you know, this is the kind of, this is why the e echo critics have picked Hopkins up, why he's so important to them. Because he says, yeah, Hopkins was there. Hopkins understood. And we can't feel anything because we're shod. You know, notice the word shod. We don't only have shoes on, but we have heavy shoes, heavy boots. We're like, we're like horses. We're like great dray, dray horses. Not, the, not beautiful stallions, but heavy dray horses. And he says, in spite of this, in spite of all of this, he says, for all of this, he says, and he, uses, he continues the uh, 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 me a metaphor of economy, of, of cost, what things are worth. And we certainly understand that in our own... <laughs> you know, times, okay? And what he says is just nature is never spent. No matter how much we, we, we try to destroy the rivers, or we try to, well, I guess he, I guess he hadn't read Cormac McCarthy's The Road, okay? Uh, where it is possible, I suppose, with the nuclear annihilation, you know, pretty much to, 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 to do it. But in Hopkins' time, he felt he would just give nature a chance, and the rivers will try to clean themselves again, you know, like the great Hudson, you know, the, Alleg uh, the Allegheny, uh, the East River, or whatever. Uh, just give them a chance, to, you know, the Connecticut. Uh, give them a chance. Uh, give, the, give, the, give the soil a chance. Uh, don't try to, you know, don't keep polluting it. Just turn off some of the smokestacks and watch the grass will, in, in fact, try to come back. The fruit will actually try to come back, you see. Uh, he says, nature is never spent because, he says, there lives the dearest freshness deep down things. Deep down, and why? Because for Hopkins, they're held up by God. It, it's God as mother, really. God is the maternal presence who cares, like a mother cares for, for her children, for her world. And he says, though the last lights of the Black West went, no matter how dark it gets, on the earth circles and light will come back. Spring will return. Spring will come back. He says, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs. Why? And this is why, not because of nature, but because of the Holy Ghost, because of the Holy Spirit, because of the presence of God, the Creator, who cares, even when we seem not to care often, he says, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods. Bent world, bent is an interesting word. It is a bent world. We've, we've whacked it out somehow, you know, like a, like a, a wheel, you know, uh, going wobbly on a car. You know, we, it's bent, but also an interesting word, bent, because it also means... Um, you look in the OED and it also means a nest. So he's going to be using that bent world. In other words, it's almost as though the world were a large nest on which sits a, the mother bird, you see, uh, trying to bring things to fruition, trying to bring the young to, uh, to hatch, you see. World broods with warm breasts. And then the final discovery, as he looks out at the mountains there to the west, uh, to, the, uh, to the east, excuse me, looks out to the east and sees the sun, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the sun coming up again, a new dawn uh, rising. And it, it's, it's, it, it's an image of the phoenix bird. It's the dove, but it's also a phoenix, you see, rising from its own ashes, afresh again. There's the hope that the young Hopkins 31 uh, had, okay? And this is what he wrote about. And he's been picked up for this. And this, is, this poem, among others, like Pied Beauty and others, are celebrated over and over and over again for that. Uh, let's move forward a little bit, OK? Let's uh, fast forward from 1877 uh, to uh, 1885. By this time, Hopkins has been in the trenches, if you will, <coughs> for, um, for uh, how many? For eight years now. Um, he's been working in Liverpool among the poor Irish. Um, he's, he's seen an awful lot of uh, hunger. Uh, he's seen an awful lot of uh, uh, battered women. Uh, he's seen a lot of families uh, uh, struggling to stay alive. Uh, this, is, this has been his world. Uh, uh, 
He's also seen something of Oxford, but he's seen the, the underbelly of Oxford, not as, a, not as an undergraduate student, but working with the, uh, the, uh, the uh, mostly Irish Catholics and then some of the converts in, 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 in Oxford, uh, but with a very strong town and gown attention. You know, and, they, and, and many of the professors at Oxford are wondering, what, what are these Jesuits doing here? You know, what are they doing back here in Oxford? You know, I thought we, got a, we kicked them out about four centuries ago. And now they're back. Um, and then, and then uh, uh, Hopkins makes a, a, a retreat, a yearly eight-day retreat. And he asks, at a, 1883, and he asks if he can be lifted up uh, to a higher measure of love for Christ. But he re and then he realizes, what have, I just, what have I just done? What have I just asked for? What does that mean? And he realizes that to be lifted up means to become more fully aware, to become more conscious, which means also the sense of um, perhaps sorrow, the sense of maturity, uh, the sense of, uh, of the injustices in the world, uh, including his beloved England. I mean, he is 110% uh, 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 English patriot. And so he's sent to Ireland. He's sent to Ireland in uh, 1884 at a time when Irish nationalism uh, 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 is on the rise. And it takes him a little time. Uh, I mean, he had seen, of course, he'd read the papers, he'd seen uh, the, the voting, for example, record with the, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, Irish uh, in, uh, in Liverpool. Uh, many of, of course, many of his, uh, of his Jesuit uh, fellow priests and brothers were, were, were Irish. But these are young students. These are young, <coughs> these are Irish undergraduates at University College in Dublin. That's the school that uh, James Joyce would go to a decade later. Had Hopkins lived to be 54 instead of 44 when he died of typhoid, his student would have been James Joyce. That would have been interesting to have that, uh, <laughs> that combination in a class. <laughs> but uh, in fact, what happens is in uh, Portrait of the Artist, it's, uh, it's Hopkins's dear friend, Father John Conmey. Uh, who gets it instead uh, by, by James Joyce. <laughs> Tundish. Uh, what, 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 do the, what do the English know about the, uh, about the language? <laughs> um, but here he is. Uh, many of his uh, uh, closest friends, students, etc., were what they call the Anglo-Irish. That is, those, those Irish who had strong affinities with the English government, you know, uh, the pr professional class, lawyers, judges, uh, doctors, uh, et cetera. Uh, but he's also seen, <laughs> he's also got like what I remember in the, in the late 60s with the, I had the, uh, all of the vociferous radicals in my class at Hunter uh, who were uh, uh, against the Vietnam War. And sometimes it was hard just to be heard in the class, much, you know, much less uh, teach anything. Uh, and I think Hopkins would have, you know, he in fact he talks a few times about that experience of, of, of having um, you know, uh, that sense of uh, distance be, uh, and antagonism even between himself and his, uh, and his students. And here he is teaching the classics Latin and Greek, when in fact most of the students there want jobs not teaching Latin and Greek, but want jobs, for example, um, in business. You know, uh, they want jobs as lawyers. They want, you know, uh, etc. They, they they want to move up. You know, as you can understand, any working class, you know, who have a chance, they're, they're going to be moving into those into those areas. But Hopkins comes within a year to realize, uh, as he tells Newman, of uh, uh, Cardinal Newman, uh, John Henry Newman that uh, he's been here now a year, and he tells Bridges, uh, his friend Robert Bridges in England, he says, you have to be here. You have to be at ground zero to understand why the Irish have to have their independence. You know, you, you, you won't agree with this, he said, but you've got to be here to realize, you know, that they're under a kind of subjugation for three centuries, which they have not agreed to. Um, so he does come over, he does, he does understand, but it still hurts. It still hurts him. Uh, because he, would, he, was, he, would, he was hoping, at least, for some kind of rapprochement where it would be possible for uh, you know, the uh, English and Irish to, to work side by side. But in, in his own time, he was not to see it. So in the midst of this, he undergoes something very much like a, uh, what we call, the, uh, what St. John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. And we'll take, let's take a look at, uh, let me read one of those poems uh, from there. It's called Carry and Comfort. Now, there are a series of these extraordinary poems. By the way, he showed nobody these poems in his own lifetime. He didn't even show his closest friend, Robert Bridges. He kept promising that he was going to show them to him, but he did not. He kept them 
in, ma- in manuscript form, sort of like with Emily Dickinson, um, uh, you know, with uh, uh, changes, you know, with the little arrows pointing, you know, half lines squiggled out, etc. And that's the way he left the poems. But as, when you put them together and you realize what he's achieved, he's achieved some of the most extraordinary uh, dark sonnets of the last two centuries. Ever, in fact, all centuries, you know, quite, quite honest. And here, here's one called Carrion Comfort. And he did not call it anything. He just, he just wrote the poem. And it was Bridges who put the title Carrion Comfort on it. Carrion Comfort. In other words, what, what is it that we feast on? What dead thing do we feast on? Uh, like a jackal or a vulture, etc. And he thinks here of uh, despair. He's afraid. You know what he's afraid of here? He's afraid he's lost three, at least three friends by suicide. Three college uh, friends who have all died uh, by suicide by their own hand, um, and he, th- strangely, like in, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, he can feel an affinity for this. You know, why go on? I mean, if this is all I've got, why go on? And he realizes he can't give in. To you know, it would be unmanly to give in to uh, you know to, uh, to 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 suicide. And so, you know, he's looking for some light. He's looking for something. It's so dark, damn dark here. And he writes this poem, he says, not, I'll not carry in comfort despair, not feast on thee, not untwist, slack they may be these last strands of man in me, or most weary cry, I can no more. I can. Can something, hope, wish day come, not choose not to be, but ah, but oh, thou terrible, why wouldst thou rude on me thy ring world right foot rock? Lay a lion limb against me, scan with darksome devouring eyes my bruised bones, and fan, oh, in turns of tempest, me heaped there, me frantic to avoid thee and flee. Why? That my chaff might fly, my grain lie, sheer and clear. Nay, in all that toil, that coil, since seems I kissed the rod, and rather my heart low lapped strength, stole joy with laugh, cheer. But cheer whom, though? The hero whose heaven handling flung me, foot trod me, or me that fought him? Or which one? Is it each one? That night? That year of now done darkness, I wretch lay wrestling with my God. My God. That's the final realization. Who have I been wrestling with? Myself? I've been wrestling with God. Like Jacob, wrestling with the angel in the dark. And then he finally realizes it. My God, my God. And of course, the my God, my God echoes. Christ's own words, don't, does, don't they? Uh, the Eli, Eli, Leme, Sabachthani, you know, as he's being crucified. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Psalm 42, I believe, that, uh, that uh, Christ utters on the cross. It's like, a, what I'm feeling, uh, Hopkins says, is rather like a crucifixion. Well, it's what I asked for in a sense. I asked to be lifted. Well, this is what it means to be lifted. There are other puns in here. For example, I'll just throw out a couple of them here. Uh, up above, he says, he says, but I, O thou terrible, which is a, a terrible. This is what in the, in the Hebrew Bible, thou terrible. Thou who can inspire terror in me with the sublime, the presence of God, the reality of God. Why wouldst thou rude on me, thy ring world right foot rock? And then you realize he's punning on the word rude. Because it's not only rude, R-U-D-E, but it's also R-O-O-D, which means the cross, you see. That's what you're doing. You're, you're crucifying me. And it's sort of like, you know, it's, to tell you the truth, God, it's sort of like a cat and mouse game. You know, you've got me, and now you're over me like a, like a cat over a mouse, you see, or like a lion over its prey, and you haven't killed it yet. You know, what are you going to do with me? 
Or he says, you know what, I, I feel like a heap. And this is an image that he uses several times throughout his work, uh, through his, throughout his life, the sense of being just, I can't even get up, I'm just a heap. I, don't, I have no strength, no energy. He says, and what do you do? You, 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 you lift me as though you were lifting a chaff and wheat. And you lift me and you fling me up as much as I dislike it. And the chaff flies off and it leaves the wheat behind. That's what you're doing. You're purifying me. And it hurts. But I know, I know, in fact, that if I'm ever going to break free of myself, because even here he says, look, he says, I kissed the rod hand rather. He says, since seems I kissed the rod. I'm not even sure now in this pain that I've actually said yes to you. Even now. Be, as Hopkins famously said, behind every yes we give is often a no. Is often a no at some deep level. Oh, yeah, I love you, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that, but, you know, there's, something is held back. And, but what you have to give here is a sense of full surrender over if you're ever going to, you know, if you're going to be fully free. This is what Hopkins is saying. So that's 1885. That's 1885, okay? Hopkins is 40 years old now. 40. He has four years to go. And he keeps grading the papers, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Greek and Latin exams, over and over, until his eyes begin to burn. And he has to wear glasses. Any of you who are teachers who have had to grade many, many papers, you know what I'm talking about, okay? You know what I'm talking As much as you love your students, it's the stack of papers like that, you know, that, that, that kind of does it. You say, I'm in hell. You know, I, <laughs> I'm in hell and there's no way out, you know? Except, uh, well, I, I, the best advice I ever got was uh, my chairman telling me, look, oh, Paul, get a bottle of good whiskey and, <laughs> and then celebrate, you know, every five papers that you do. <laughs> And after a while, it won't matter what the papers say. <laughs> but uh, but let's, let's look at the, uh, the nature, the final poem here. Now, what's happening in August of, uh, uh, no, no, July. In July of uh, uh, 1888, okay, uh, the summers were for Hopkins the busiest time of the year because all these students, uh, Irish students that wanted to matriculate into the colleges, into the Catholic colleges, had to uh, take the exams. And he was so, so, uh, how shall I say it, so careful. He knew that, you know, the fate of a student depended on the grade that they got for these entrance exams, you see? And so he worked out a system where, okay, all right, you didn't get it quite right. So I'm going to give you a half a point. Well, I can't really give you a half a point because you really got it mostly wrong. But I can give you a quarter of a point. Well, I can't really give you a quarter of a point. But it's possible. I think I can give you an eighth of a point here. <laughs> now, try, uh, try multiplying that system by, say, 600 papers at a time in Greek. OK, in Greek, all right? And then multiply that by six times, at least, OK, uh, during the year. This is what Hopkins was, was doing, this great poet. This is. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, so he writes, he, he goes out, he says, look, I'm, I, I was so exhausted one afternoon that I just simply stopped reading, uh, got, went out and uh, went out and uh, walked the streets of Dublin, and uh, it had been raining, it, you know, it rains, between, it rains between the showers very often in Ireland, right? Mm -hmm. And it had stopped raining for a few minutes, and he went out, and he looks up into the heavens, and he's always been a cloud gazer and a stargazer, always looking at the clouds, always looking at them for some kind of significance. You know, I wondered for years how that, what that meant. And then I was driving um, home a couple of months ago, and I, uh, you know, I'm driving and I'm looking up at the, these beautiful clouds at evening and watching them shape shift, not only in terms of their form, but in terms of the color, you know, as the sun is going down and the moisture and all. And I was struck by, suppose, suppose that really was not just random, but suppose it was like a, a, an artist out there. It was actually doing this, you know, creating this beautiful uh, uh, kind of uh, Stevensian auroras of autumn for me. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know. But it was, it was just, it gave a whole new sense that, uh, that God is continually painting. You know, he's continually coloring. He's continually recreating every single second uh, throughout time. He doesn't just do it and then stand off, you know, James Joyce's image of uh, you know, paring his fingernails off at the distance. No, but a God who's invested completely, imminent, you know, and is continually uh, uh, working with creation every single moment, every single moment. And the only thing is you've got to look. You've got to 
kind of try to catch it, okay? So, here's the poem, The Nature of the Heraclitian. Let me just say a few words about it. It's a sonnet, but it's a caudated sonnet. What Hopkins, he learned this from uh, uh, Milton, from John Milton. It's, it's an extended sonnet with caud, cauda, or tails, or tails on it, okay? So it goes on for about 21, 22 lines, okay? It's an extraordinary poem, a ex- beautiful, beautiful poem. And it begins, he looks up at the clouds with, as he's been looking up at the clouds, and he's written about clouds and waves, you know, those kinds of motions, you know, oscillations in nature, ever since he was a teenager. And now he's, uh, he's 43, or just two days shy, I think, of his 43rd birthday. And he looks up and he, oh my God, he said, I never realized that, yeah, they're beautiful clouds, but you know what? It's really, it's a great big bonfire. That's really what it is. The whole world's on fire. The whole world is a Heraclitean fire. And it's changing. It's being burned up. Everything is, whatever's here is not going to be here in a few more years. It'll be changed and changed and changed. And I won't be here anymore. And there's a kind of terrifying sense of simply being, you know, eliminated, annihilated, you know, by, by time and by, by the events of, you know, of change. But he begins, he says, I'll read it, and then I'll talk a little bit more about it. He says, <clears throat> cloud puffball. Actually, I could sing this poem. I could. I'm not going to, though. <laughs> but let me explain why. I really believe that by the time that Hopkins, uh, by Spell from Sybil's Leaves in 1885, I believe that he has found a new kind of a music um, which is close to a kind of ancient plain chant. Okay? So you could read it sort of like, Cloud, puffball, torn tufts, toss pillows, flaunt forth, then Chevy on an air-built thoroughfare. You could do that. Uh, But I won't do that for you. Uh, I'll just read it. But think of that other rhythm, you know, that kind of plain chant, which he says, think about it. He says, plain chant. It goes back to the monks, you know, in the Middle Ages, and then back to the early, you know, to the Roman period, and it goes back to the Greeks, you know, the Greek choruses. For Hopkins, there was a continuum from the time of the Greeks uh, through plain chant, and he says, we've lost all of that extraordinary music, and what we have is instead player piano music. You know, the, the four beat. Tonky, tonk, 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 tonk. Well, you know, that's nice, but, you know, but there's also plain chant, you know. Uh, maybe some of you in church would like to hear a little plain chant once in a while, as opposed to, Kumbaya, mother, you know, or whatever, you know what I mean. Uh, uh, it's possible, it's possible we could get back to some of the ancient tradition, musical tradition as well. That's what my Jesuit son keeps telling me we could do. All right. Anyway, here's the poem. Cloud, puffball, torn tufts, tossed pillows, flaunt forth, then Chevy on an air-built thoroughfare. Heaven roisters in gay gangs, they throng, they glitter in marches. Down rough cast, down dazzling whitewash, wherever an elm arches, Shive lights and shadow tackle in long lashes, lace, lance, and pear. Delightfully, the bright wind boisterous ropes, rustles, beats earth bare of yester tempest's creases. In pool, in rut peel, parches, squandering ooze to squeeze dough, crust, dust, stanches, starches, squadron masks, and man marks, treadmire, toil there, foot fritted in it. Million fueled, nature's bonfire burns on. But quench her bonniest, dearest to her, her clearest self's spark man. How fast his fire dint, his mark on mind is gone. Both are in an unfathomable, all is in the enormous dark, drowned. Oh, pity and indignation. Man shape that shone sheer off, to several, a star, death blots black out, nor mark is any of him at all so stark, but vastness blurs, and time beats level. Enough. The resurrection. A heart's clarion. Away griefs gasping, joyless days dejection. Across my foundering deck shone a beacon, an eternal beam. Flesh fade and mortal trash fall to the residuary worm. World's wildfire leave but ash. In a flash, at a trumpet crash, 
I am all at once what Christ is since he was what I am. And this Jack, Joke, Poor Potcher, Patch Matchwood, Immortal Diamond, is Immortal Diamond. That's where it comes down to. All right, I will go through all of these changes, but it's like a diamond, in, you know, like a piece of coal under the pressure that's finally transformed under those pressures into diamond. We burn away the dross, and what's left is I am and, and diamond, the nice beautiful rhyme on those, on those two words. And also the I am uh, uh, that you get in the uh, Hebrew, in the Hebrew uh, Bible. The I am is, you know, uh, who is, I am who am. And also Jesus, you know, again, speaking in, in, especially in John. I am, I am, I am. As a sign that I am divinity. I am God. And now Hopkins says, I too, because you were what I am now. You led the way. You took on flesh. So you raised flesh. And we can, you can lift us all into, uh, into, the, into the presence of God. It's an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary poem. I mean, I, I, I just spent another four or five hours reading it today. Uh, and I was just impressed by so many. Um, even just one thing, uh, the, the, the rhyme scheme, which is a Petrarchan sonnet, but then with, the, with these cordes, these uh, tails attached to them. And I realized, wait, he's metamorphosing. He's morphing the rhymes. Uh, rhymes like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, shown and gone becoming resurrection, dejection, so that they're both the ION, they're similar, but they're also different. And that's, that's sort of what the morphing of the resurrection is. Uh, you know, when Mary says, who are you? Uh, are you the gardener? You know, in the, in the, on, on that Easter morning. <coughs> Mary, he says, Mary, you know, and that does it, Mary, by name. So what, is, what will resurrected life be like? Uh, Hopkins has an early poem in which he talks about the you know, what the nature of the resurrection of life will be. He said, but you know, uh, it will be transformed. Our bones will have risen. Uh, and this is, the, this is what he, he has to hold on to, the promise, the promise of, of Christ's life. Uh, notice the image that he had said. He says, across my foundering deck shone a beacon. Very interesting image, because here he is, a year before his death, and he's thinking back to those nuns, those five women who died on that ship. And he had called the tall nun, the leader, a beacon. And she had been a beacon because in the midst of the storm in which people were drowning, being pulled over, over uh, hauled over the side of the ship in the, in the storm, in the winter storm, she had cried out, Christ, oh Christ, come quickly. And, he, and Hopkins thinks, what a, what effect did it have in the midst of, say, uh, 911, you know, or some kind of disaster like that, for someone to cry out, uh, Christ? Would it, would it be a curse? Would it be a swear? Would it be, or would it be a call, a, a, you know, a moment of attention to, to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Christ that is always there, even in, even in those terrible uh, moments, so Hopkins, uh, so Hopkins believed. So you can, get a, you can get rid of the, the jack and the joke, and you can get rid of the poor potsherd, you know, a fragment of, of pottery, and you can get rid of a patch and match wood, a, you know, a, a match that flares up, but also to match the wood of the cross, you see, because he has also undergone a kind of crucifixion. And at the bottom of all that is immortal diamond. Immortal diamond. That he won't give up. That, that's, that remains, okay? So I just wanted to go over... Uh, some of these poems with you, and then I wanted to uh, I wanted to read. Uh, Hopkins has been. I, I've written six volumes of poetry. I'm on the middle of about halfway through the seventh. Okay, and Hopkins is. I must say, uh, you know, I, I've, I've written biographies of William Carlos Williams from New Jersey. Okay, and uh, and uh, Hart Crane from New York, and uh, and uh, John Berryman, you know, from Minneapolis, and uh, Robert Lowell from Boston. And I almost did one. I turned it down finally on Wallace Stevens. I just said, I don't know if I'll live long enough for it, so maybe I <laughs> let somebody younger uh, do it. I don't know. Maybe I'll go back to it. It depends on how I feel. But uh, that would be my next project, I think, would be to do Wallace Stevens. But uh, 
but 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 at the heart of it, for me, uh, not only in terms of uh, not only in terms of poetry, but if, if I can just say a few words about this. Yeah, the poetry is important, okay. But then, what about the life? You know, what about the example of the man himself? I think that's what really draws me back to Hopkins, Father Hopkins. He was a good Jesuit. Um, he did not have it easy. He was a good citizen. Uh, he did his he did his work. Um, he had a great sense of humor. Father Joe Feeney is a specialist uh, on that playfulness in Hopkins, and it's all over the place. Uh, he had that real. Uh, brilliant Victorian wit, you know, that, uh, that you, you have with uh, so many of the uh, uh, English and Irish figures of the late 19th century. And uh, he had all of that. Uh, but what draws me to him in a, w that in a way that doesn't draw me, that I'm not drawn by any other figure. Uh, to some degree, perhaps, uh, George Herbert. To some degree, um, T.S. Eliot, okay. Uh, some of the younger poets like Franz Wright, or Mary Carr, uh, Denise Levitoff, there are, you know, there are a number out there, but at the, uh, John Berryman, Lowell, okay. But at the heart of it for me is, uh, is the example of Hopkins. And I must say, for example, when, I've, when I made the 30-day retreat uh, back about nine years ago, uh, the importance of significance, I didn't bring any Hopkins with me. And it, in fact, it was my uh, spiritual director, Father J.J. Bresnahan, who said, what are you doing here without Hopkins, you know? <laughs> And so he said, here, take my copy. It was a, you know, an old uh, dog-leafed uh, copy of uh, paperback of, of Hopkins. And he said, meditate on these. Meditate. You know, you hear, listen to them. And it was, it, 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 I'm glad I did. Uh, I had only brought a Bible with me in the spiritual exercises. But that was, the, that was the direction that my director wanted me to go in. And I was glad to go in it. And I think that by the end of the of the retreat, towards the end, I began to have the sense that, now this is weird, but that he was sort of there for me, you know, he was actually there at, at Eastern Point with me uh, in a very special way. Not that he spoke, I mean, I had his words, I, you know, but just the, the presence of Hopkins to console me, to get me through uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the tough spots, and then, and then through the, uh, the final breakthrough, uh, into a kind of an, a light in, in which everything just seemed to be filled with light. That, that's the, or children, children laughing and singing. They weren't there, but they were there in the imagination. You know, they were there in that January, uh, January winter. Uh, I'd wake up and I could hear kids. I love kids. Uh, I've got five grandchildren. I, I'm their play slave. And uh, <laughs> I really, I just love them. I, I really do. Uh, there's something so innocent about them, and, and yet, and it's so, so, so straightforward, and they tell you exactly what they mean. You know, you look fat, uh, Grandpa. <laughs> you look awfully tired, Grandpa, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever. Um, or they're, they're, you know, just, just so much, just wonderful. Uh, and I, I guess I think of Elliot, you know, with the, with the children laughing in the trees, you know, uh, in, the, in the four quartets. But it's, it, that's the image that, you know, it, it would be something else uh, for e each of you, I suppose. But those were the images that, uh, that, uh, came, that came to me. So I thought I would uh, just look at uh, one poem, um, which it, it, you may not think it's, it's really about Hopkins. It's called Eurydice. Uh, it's a recent poem. And uh, I, you may have copies of it, I think, many of you. I'll read this one. Uh, and it talks about Thomas Hardy, but even there with Thomas Hardy, it's really Hopkins that I'm thinking about in the background. Because uh, I know Hardy, I know what Hardy, uh, you know, who's is a contemporary, really, you know, you think Hardy is born in 1840 and Hopkins is born in 1844. Hardy would live until 1928, Hopkins died in 1889. Nevertheless, and, and, and Hardy is a, um, an agnostic, a kind of uh, pretty thorough agnostic. Uh, brilliant, liberal mind, um, great writer, great poet, great novelist. Um, but it, for me, it's not enough. Uh, it's a simple, so I, I keep coming back again to Hopkins. Anyway, this is a story about teaching. When I was uh, going for my PhD in New York, I was at uh, the Graduate Center, the City University, which really meant at that time that I was at uh, Hunter. I was teaching police officers downtown, including Frank Serpico. You may remember that name. Uh, downtown, and then I was teaching radical students <laughs> up at Lehman College, uptown, okay, and then I was taking classes at Hunter, and I was teaching this, a night class, and I remember this, uh, a, a winter's tale. 
I was teaching up at Hunter, a night class, 1966 or 7, <coughs> mostly stenographers and clerks with nine to five jobs somewhere in Manhattan or the boroughs. Introduction to poetry and prose, the 101 variety. And that evening, it was Thomas Hardy, Hap, the darkling thrush, the convergence of the twain, the appointed iceberg peeling the skin off the Titanic like some sardine can. Bleak and heady stuff for a bleak and heady time. Nam, napalm, race riots, Agent Orange, the whole shebang. And I was on that night, my best imitation Orphic voice, rhapsodizing on blind necessity and fate, the marriage of a massive ship, state of the art, with some far more massive iceberg. Hardy's hope seemed a hollow thing in the face of so much suffering, as I suppose he wanted it to pale for the poem he was writing. No one to blame, no grand design, no god or gods, no anything but a rolling of blind dice. I preened myself. After all, I was 26 and understood the mossy myths, dark and cold, that have told us since before the Greeks how the world really works. And then the time was up, and the students gathered up their things and headed out. I was packing my books and the papers I would have to grade back in our small apartment out in Flushing, where I lived with my wife and two small sons, trying to finish my degree against the odds. It was late, past 10, and the wind blowing down the cold corridors of New York. I meant to head straight for the subway around the corner to begin the long ride home on the IRT, which, along with other huddled masses, would take me there. I looked up to see a woman standing by my desk, neither young nor old, one of my students, as nameless as the rest. She seemed shaken and her face was pale. You're a good man, she was saying. Tell me you don't believe the things you said tonight. Tell me you believe there is a God. Understand, this was outré and unprofessional on her part, almost comic, except she looked as if I'd robbed her. And for what it matters, I did subscribe to something like a creed, or thought I did. But we were talking poetry here. And this was New York City, not some Porongville. I assured her my own beliefs had nothing to do with it. These were Hardy's gifts to us, the poems, written out of a world he had suffered. True, he wasn't everyone's cup of tea, a brilliant use of language I warm myself by thinking. And the skeptic's view was something she might sip on, a way of adding to the available stock of reality we are heir to. I turned towards the elevator and bowed good night, then walked quickly down the long, cold corridors and past the guard, out prepared his sinister mate for her. The place was almost empty at that hour, and I already at the turnstile, when I saw her following at a distance, her lips moving with the cold. I'm hard of hearing, and the train was already entering the station, so I tried to read her lips. Please, her eyes were saying above the racket of the place. You're a good man. Tell me you believe. Eurydice, I thought, drowning in a hell of her own making, pallid and accusing, and I some unwitting Orpheus. For Christ's sake, this to myself, and then to her, I do believe, okay? I do. I do. Even if just then I felt nothing but annoyance. And to tell the truth, a touch of icy terror. Please. Go home, it's late. Everything's okay. A gesture only, comforting someone who needed to be comforted. You have questions about Hopkins. Do you have questions about the poetry? Yes, please. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear a little more about um, what, how, how reading Hopkins on retreat uh, might be different from, you know, yeah. Hopkins yeah. on a train or yeah. your study. Yes. Good, yeah, very an important question. Reading, reading Hopkins or reading really uh, many, many texts on a retreat 
situation rather than teaching it in a classroom. Um, part of it is the, uh, the sense that you can, it's, uh, it's like the Lexio Divina. You know, you can keep coming back and back and back, say to the same phrase, you know, the same sentence, the same passage. You know, they'll give you a, a passage and, you know, the, the director, you meet the director once a day for maybe 40 minutes and then you're off on your own for silence for the rest of the day. And you may have a couple, one or two passages and you go over them over and over and over. Uh, I'm just thinking of uh, a good friend of mine, a, a, a priest, Father Warren Savage, uh, a diocesan priest up there in Western uh, uh, Mass who's, who's become more and more interested in the mystics and he's become the spiritual advisor to many deacons and priests. And he, and he uh, gave one uh, a deacon, the fellow who's studying to be deacon in my parish, and he said, I want, you to, I want you to study for the whole week the simple passage where Christ, at the Last Supper, takes off his robe, his outer robe, and girds himself with a towel, you know, half naked, then kneels down and begins to wash the feet of his disciples, the same ones who will, in a very short time, all run like shot dogs, you know, or you know, if they haven't betrayed him outright, you know. Just think about that and go back to it. And this is what happens when you go back to uh, to Hopkins. Uh, you see, it's not just it's not just a matter of a text, a, a cerebral text, or and what you try to do is, in poetry at least you try to get not only the, the philosophical, you know, the meaning, if you will, but beyond the meaning, you try to get something of the passion, you know, as, as though you were, you, know, you were teaching theater. You know, you, you try to get something of the human voice behind that. But, okay, there's that. And that goes a, a, a ways. But then there's something more. Uh, and it has to do with a, an almost a kind of confrontation with, I say with Hopkins. You know, it's, it struck me, though, the more I studied Hopkins, you know, the more I saw Hopkins or felt Hopkins' presence, well, all that really, what really finally happened to me was that, in a sense, Hopkins was but one of the many faces of Christ, if that makes any sense. It's sort of like, uh, what is that, the shack? I never finished it, but some of you may have read it, you know. But I, I, I got about halfway through it, but there were some passages in there that really talked to, spoke to me, and that is that God takes many, many forms, whatever you feel comfortable with. If you want to see him um, um, as, a, uh, as a young laborer, if you want to see him uh, as a black woman in her 50s, if you want to see, a, see him as a, uh, 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 a biblical, uh, say a Jewish biblical scholar, you know, reading the Torah, uh, however you want to see God, that's fine. God will go with that, you see, but that's not God. That's just one aspect, if you will, one element. And I found that, you know, that was one of the surprises, that here I'd been studying Hopkins. I wanted to be more, see, here's the, I didn't want to just study, I wanted to be like, well, what is it that Berryman said about uh, Yeats? He said, I didn't want to write like Yeats, he said. I wanted to be Yeats. <laughs> Talk about chutzpah, okay? <laughs> uh, and, and, but there's something to that, you know. You really come to identify with that individual, and you want to, how did you get, how was it? that you got, Hopkins, how did you get there? How did you actually get to write these words? I've been trying all my life. Other poets like Berryman, Lowell, and Levitoff have also spent their lives trying to write like this. And none of them quite can do it. You know, they, use, they, they model themselves, but they, you know, it's, it's, what is this? And so then you say, okay, but what else is there? What else is there? And I, and I find the kindnesses. So then I find Hopkins, for example, he writes a letter and he says, look, I've taken a vow of poverty. But that doesn't mean that I can't send, he's writing to his mother, and he says, I, that doesn't mean I can't send you this bird's feather. Because it belongs to me. It belongs to the whole world. And I send it to you, mother. You know? And it's such a Franciscan gesture. Yeah, I send a feather in the, in the envelope. You know? I send you uh, the sun. You know, I send you uh, greetings. Uh, and there's that. And then there's the, you know, the little things, like he'll say something like this that really uh, move me. He says... Uh, Thank you, Mom, for the, uh, thank you, Mother, for the uh, sweater that you took so much time to knit. I've just given it to a poor woman. How's that? The mother must feel awfully good about that. <laughs> but, you know, but you see, there's that gesture. You know, it's, this woman needs that sweater even more than I do, and so I give it to her, you know. Um, I, I just find 
Can I give you one other example about another poet? That, that really, William Carlos Williams from uh, Patterson, you know, from uh, Rutherford, New Jersey, up here, right? Spent ten years, at least ten years, with him. Okay, Williams was a doctor, a baby doctor, and and he also did house calls over and over and over and over. And one of the stories that struck me was something that a druggist, one of the drug, I, I mean, in the old sense of the word, um, <laughs> as a, <laughs> uh, told me about about Williams. What Williams would do is. If, uh, if, if poor, a poor patient who couldn't pay, you know, for the uh, for the visit, came and Williams was aware that the person didn't have the money, he would say, "Okay, uh, go to this doctor, go to this druggist, and get this prescription. You need this prescription." And he would put a little note on the top in shorthand. And what the drug? So the druggist would get the prescription, but it, he'd also see the little note. And what the note meant? It was a shorthand. It meant this. This person wasn't able, doesn't have the money, didn't pay, you know, be able to pay me for the doc doctor's visit. That's all he would say. And then the druggist would not charge them for the medicine. It's not a good way to make a living. <laughs> it's extraordinary, though. It really, it, you know. And when I heard that story, suddenly Williams goes from just being a poet, you know, to something else. He becomes a model. And, and, uh, one other example with, 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 with Williams. He goes to a, an old woman's house there in Patterson, and the woman is cold, and she's got, she's got pneumonia. So he, he gives her the, you know, he gives her a checkup, and then he um, uh, gives her medicine. But the house is cold because the furnace has gone out. So before he leaves, and he could have just said, "Have a good day," you know, uh, keep warm, you know. Uh, so what he does is he goes down into the basement and he starts the furnace, gets the coal in it, and, and gets it going, and then he and then he goes. Okay, it's just as, or, or here's another one that, that, that really touches me, Hawthorne. Okay, Hawthorne, whose whose daughter became a, a you know the founder of what the Sisters of Charity, I believe. Uh, Hawthorne uh, is in England in Liverpool, and uh, he, he he talks about this kid, this little orphan who's w watching him, and the kid has nobody. The kid has snot coming down his nose. Okay, and he's and he's scabs and everything, but the kid wants to be held. He can, and Hawthorne can tell the kid wants to be picked up. And so Hawthorne says, it, it, I, there was a shudder in me, you know, because you know, he was so dirty, but I did it. I had to hold him. I think that one gesture was enough for his daughter to become a, a convert and, and to go on to become a nun and to found the, uh, the sister of charity. It's amazing where these things touch. But these are things that, you know, on retreat, for example, that come to the foreground and that, in fact, change not just one's aesthetic sense, but change the very core of one's being. And I think if you teach long enough, you know, I remember John Montague, the Irish poet. Uh, we were having a couple of beers about 30 years ago. And I remember I showed him one of my uh, poems about my son. And I remember him saying to me, he said, uh, you know, that's a good poem. Uh, he said, you know, for a young guy like you. Uh, <laughs> uh, he said, you know, I would love to write a poem like this about my children, he said but I'm not ready. It may take me another 10 years. In other words, it's not just a matter of you know, a technique, you see. It was a matter of a change of meta, you know, metanoia. It was a change of heart. It was a change of who you were. And when you change that way, then the poetry will follow. You take a look at Hopkins' early work, and it's OK, but you, it would have been buried a long time ago. Under the pressure of, you know, of, being, you know, of, of Jesuit formation, and under the pressure of going from a, a comfortable upper middle class to working so you know often with with uh, uh, the poor, if you will, you know, with with those who did not, or, or from different backgrounds, he changed, and it, it 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 expanded who he was as a human being, and that was important if he was ever going to, you know, he gets to Wales and he, he hears the old Welsh women speaking Welsh, you know, and he says, I want to learn that language, and by learning it. This is what changes his poetry. The poetry is uh, what's underlying it is is those Celtic you know rhythms of Welsh, and then later it will be the Irish when he gets to Ireland. That's how you grow. You listen. It's what Williams calls there's the male of it and the female of it. Okay, what what Williams meant was the male of it would be sort of like Ezra Pound, his buddy Ezra Pound. Okay, and T. S. Eliot and the others. That would be the text. That would be the text that you read. And so text talks the text, the kind of thing that Harold Bloom talks about all the time. Okay, and that's good. But then William says, besides text talking to text, there's also the feminine aspect. There's also the maternal. There's also the woman. And that means the language of the Polish mothers that I take care of. 
And how do I get that language, the language of New Jersey, or the language of Wayne, you know, uh, Pennsylvania, into my text? You see? How do I get that in there? Of course, for him, he also was aware, you know, because of his interest in jazz, and all, you know, the African American language, and how that was transforming the entire body of the language in, in our time. And it goes on and on and on and on, but that's how you, you grow beyond just being the poet into being a great poet, or a very, you know, a very good to a great poet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, please. I don't want to let sure. this poem go. Do you want to say a little bit more about it and maybe Eurydice, and then maybe also a little elaborate a little bit more on like, its connection with, with Hopkins? Okay, yeah. Uh, the relationship between the Eurydice poem. For me, one of the things I learned early on, um, you know, you start out and you think, you know, you've, you've got a PhD, you know what I mean? And uh, you, 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 you know, you're a, forgive me, you know, you're, a, you're starting out, you know, as an, as an assistant professor somewhere. And so that puts you, you see, I come from a working class background and I never want to forget that. And it, it's important to me uh, to keep that sense, that woman, that nameless woman, here I am, I'm teaching, but I'm having a bad impact on this one woman whose name I don't know, I never learned it, okay? And it stayed with me all these years. You know, what did I do? What the hell did I do that night? Uh, 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 her eyes, there was something in her eyes. Now, you know, most professors, I don't know, they'd say, well, look, you know, uh, accept it, you know, uh, get over it, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, it's not that easy for me. These, uh, it, it's something out of the, for me, it's probably the larger Catholic tradition, Christian tradition, Jewish Christian tradition. It's also the Jesuit tradition that it's the whole person not just the cerebral, you know, it's not just the mind, you know, I'm, I'm grading, but to have an impact to, you know, to be, to, to, to see the humanity of, 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 of the people that you're, you're privileged. You're privileged to teach. Think about privilege. You know, I, I, I think of my chairman, uh, chairwoman, uh, who, whose son now is going to Boston College, and she, she started out the year by saying, remember the privilege that we have to actually work with and to per perhaps shape the, ch the, the kids, the young people that you, know, you know, uh, that you have in your class. That's, that's a real privilege. Keep that, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Um, so when I went through this poem, I realized, you know, I, I come away with a sense of um, I'm hanging onto the strap, right, you know, in, in the poem, you know, in Eurydice. And I'm thinking, to tell you the truth, I'm thinking of a poem by Hart Crane, Hart Crane the poet, in, 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 the, in his magnificent The Bridge. And in it, uh, Crane is un, uh, going at midnight, he's drunk, and he's going down under the, under the East River. You know, instead of walking across the Brooklyn Bridge, he's taking the, um, the uh, subway out to Clark Street, you know, on, on the other side in, in Brooklyn. And it's midnight, and the only other woman, uh, the only other person on the train, uh, Crane says in the poem, is, uh, is a, uh, he, calls her, he calls her a WAP washerwoman. Now, he had started out by talking about the brilliance and the promise of Columbus. And this is what's happened with the Italian-American tradition down to his own time, a woman who's had to clean spittoons, you know, et cetera, all night, you know, and is now finally going home to her family, okay? And uh, it, you, know, you know it's breaking his heart. And then he looks out the window and he sees these amber lights, and suddenly, he sees a vision of the American poet. And what he sees is the disembodied head of Edgar Allan Poe hanging from a strap, back and forth, looking at him. Or those scabrous eyes in uh, Joyce's uh, Portrait of the Artist. You know, that, that, there was something of that. And is this what I had done to myself when you look in the mirror? And this is what, you know, now what I'm, what I'm trying to do by a kind of negative example is to say, don't go this way. Don't do this, you know. Um, be kind to others, etc. But sometimes the impact can come by a negative uh, example when you don't do it, because the reader then will say, "You sob, I'm never going to, you know, do that, etc., etc., etc." And then it works. To, it has it has not only an aesthetic effect; it can also perhaps have a practical effect, you know, in in one's morality, one's way of uh, working. Yeah. Did I see any other hands? Uh, yes, please. Um, I believe it was in God of the Imagination you wrote that Hardy haunted you. Does Hardy still haunt you? 
Yeah. Does Hardy still haunt me? Yes. Uh, look, this is a tough one. I don't know where this is going to go. I'm going to, I'll be honest with you, okay? Uh, hmm. What do I want to say? <laughs> I want to be careful here. Okay. Uh, look. You know, getting where I've gotten, in a sense, here I am with the privilege of speaking to you, right? That doesn't come without a cost, okay? It doesn't come without a cost. And the thing is this, uh, I mean a cost, personal cost is what I mean. Uh, so that at four o'clock in the morning, I'm often awakened by a presence. And it's got a shimmering, it's, it's sort of what Ignatius saw uh, with the serpent. And, and once I'm aware of it, I realize that uh, it's a bad, a bad karma, you know, and then get the hell out of here, you know, you know. Be gone, Satan, you know, etc. Um, I smell you for one of my own, you know. Uh, there is the sense of, uh, I was reading, uh, I've been reading, or I did read, uh, Mother Teresa's uh, letters, and you see the darkness that, she, you know, even though she's helping hundreds and hundreds of people, her own sense of, you know, the, a kind of dark night of the soul. And this is what Hopkins is experiencing. And I spoke to my wife about this, and because, you know, I'm aware of just how uh, cunning and just how brilliant the, the uh, like with Aquinas, the other side, the other arguments are. You know, I'm, I'm, open, to the, I'm open to listening, but, but it costs. You know what I mean? I mean, I know that Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, you know, and Swinburne and, you know, uh, whoever, uh, all have something to say. But it's just that I don't want to go down that road because the road seems to move towards death. Uh, death. Um, well, well, I mean an imaginative death is what I mean, okay? And so what's hard is to try to keep the hope alive in the dark times. You see what I mean? This is something that, uh, that Hopkins has also helped me with. How did he get through that, you know, that dark period and then come out the other side? Um, and, I, and my wife comforted me with this one. She said, you know, Paul, think about, you know, we're, you know you're a spokesman now in a sense, you know, you've, you, you know with your poetry and your, and, 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 and your you know, God of the imagination. So of course, you're a prime target, baby. You know, you're going to get hit with this stuff and you're going to have to face it. Um, and so one of the specters that comes to me uh, is the brilliant, uh, if you will, uh, very sad, poignant uh, liberalism uh, and secularism and agnosticism of a figure like Thomas Hardy. Because Hardy really does stand in, not just for Hardy, but he stands in for a whole range of, of, of secular minds, you know, who say, what are you, you're too immature to believe, you know, in th this sort of thing. And so there's that temptation, and you've got to face it, and then you've got to you know, uh, move, move beyond it. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I didn't even think I was going to say that, but there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, how are we doing? Uh, I think we have enough time for one more, if there is, if there is one more question. Uh, there it is, right there, please. Yes. You talked a lot about Hopkins' influence on you. What? Hopkins' influence on you. Yes. Uh, certainly a way that Hopkins influenced you on throughout the poem we read tonight, a lot of his work is military. And I wonder if you might talk a bit about uh, your impressions of Hopkins's negotiation with Milton and other poetic His association with, did you say with Milton? Milton, yes. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, Hopkins and Milton, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, Milton is the, you, there are a couple of great forces behind, uh, uh, behind, uh, behind Hopkins. There's Shakespeare, I think that's clear. Uh, but there's Milton. And of course, uh, he and Robert Bridges, um, who would later become, that, that would become his literary executor. He would also become later the, uh, uh, he would become the poet laureate of England. But Bridges and Hopkins were fascinated by the um, metrical experimentations that they found in Milton. You know, as they studied Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained and, and Samson Agonistes, et cetera. Uh, and, they, and, and, and they said, look, look, Milton was already there. Milton was already using this kind of spondaic packing or this, a, a form, he didn't call it sprung rhythm, but he's using sprung rhythms. <coughs> and uh, in fact, it's Hopkins, you know, Bridges is very good, but I think that Hopkins ha is teaching Bridges a lot about this. He said, Robert, you know, you've got it partly right, uh, but let's go deeper. And, they, and they're going back and forth like this, but it went on and on and on. I mean, uh, uh, all, of, all, of the, all of Hopkins' life, 
this question of, you know, where, for example, the caudated sonnets, they come out of Milton, for example, just one example, right? Uh, and, and, and of course, when Hopkins hasn't got his books in front of him, he says, okay, how do I write a caudated sonnet? He writes Bridges, and Bridges says, Milton, just take a look at Milton, you know? And uh, the, oh, of course, you know? So it's, it's continually, and then after Hopkins' death, uh, Bridges continues to study Milton and to write on Milton's prosody. Uh, he had already written several essays in, in Hopkins' lifetime, but he continues, uh, you know, with this. Now, this goes down the... Uh, I, I was reading... Uh, uh, here's a figure. William Carlos Williams, you know, in, you know, writing in the American Idiom. But he's got a poem that he writes in 1946 about going out to... Uh, traveling out across country to... Uh, uh, to uh, uh, Oklahoma. And... Uh, uh, and... No, New Mexico, sorry, New Mexico. He goes out to New Mexico and he writes a poem in which he uses one of Bridges' poems based on Milton's scansion and then tries to use the American language, you know, the idiom, on top of that to show how he's in fact following Bridges, following by extension Hopkins, following by extension Milton, and what this would sound like if it was uh, written by a guy from New Jersey. You see what I mean? Uh, but, but it's there. You see what I mean? So it, it goes on and on and on. It, it takes all kinds of transformations, you know, uh, uh, poetic transformations, verbal transformations, linguistic, uh, metrical, trans musical transformations. But, but yes, I mean, you have to go back. I mean, uh, words are with the code. You know, we all, I mean, uh, Eliot, right? Uh, Eliot writing two essays on Milton. The first one saying, don't read Milton, right? And then a couple of years later saying, it's all right. You may read Milton, OK? <laughs> So, yeah, it's, he's out there, and he's a major, major force. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I guess that's it then, right? Yeah. Thank you very much.